art. And then we will be live on YouTube. All right. Okay, so um, welcome everybody. I am Dr. Deirdre Pickerel and I am the Dean of Student Success at Yorkville University and the Toronto Film School. On behalf of the student success team, I am very pleased to welcome you to today's Ask an Expert session. As we begin, we acknowledge that the land Yorkville University operates on in British Columbia, where I'm located, is the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples of the Kakite and the Coquitlam First Nations. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. Today, I have the incredible honor and privilege of welcoming two amazing people to our Ask an Expert. Tamina Jaffrey is the, universe, is the Yorkville University and Toronto Film School diversity consultant and moderator of today, today's events. And Dr. Lois Edge is our speaker. Thank you both for being here. I really appreciate it and I'm looking forward to the session. And Tamina, with no further ado, over to you. Sure. Um, so I just wanted to uh, thank Dr. Lois Edge for her presence here and for sharing her knowledge with us today. This conversation is a really important step, um, albeit an introductory one, in the journey of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. We're really fortunate to be having this discussion. It's very timely given the tragic discovery, um, recent discovery of the remains of 215 Indigenous students at a Kamloops, BC residential school and the fact that Canada is very much um, committed now to investigating other similar horrific historical uh, events um, from the residential schools period. So we're very honored and grateful that Dr. Edge uh, is here with us today. And uh, I want to introduce Dr. Edge and then I will um, pass the mic over to her. Uh, so Dr. Lois Edge is an instructor at Yorkville University and has developed and teaches the Indigenous Perspectives in Canadian Education course. And that's in our Masters of Education program. She's also a member of the Northwest Territories Métis Nation. Uh, Dr. Edge has earned a doctorate in educational policy studies with a specialization in Indigenous people's education from the University of Alberta. She has taught courses in Indigenous education at various post-secondary institutions, and her interests include Indigenous education, cultural regeneration and research, ethno-history, auto-ethnography, and Dene Métis lifeways. Uh, in addition to that, Indigenous women, ancestral knowledge, and Indigenous arts and social policy. Um, uh, Dr. Edge is a grandmother and enjoys engaging in land-based activities with her granddaughter. Uh, she's also an Indigenous Studies instructor for the Bachelor of Education program at Aurora College at the Baca campus in her home community of Fort Smith, Northwest Territories. Um, so I would like to uh, invite Dr. Edge to please um, have the mic. Uh, thank you, uh, Thamina, for that uh, warm welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to join you here today. Um, I'm going to read uh, from some uh, prepared notes um, uh, that will focus uh, with a focus more on uh, the topic of residential schools in the context of Indigenous History Month here in Canada. Um, I am open to um, discuss discuss other topics um, when I'm when I'm finished. Um, so I'm going to uh, introduce myself as as uh, in a a traditional, uh, traditional manner as, as is, has become uh, standardized and, and commonplace uh, today. Uh, so good day, uh, good afternoon uh, to those of you in Atlantic Canada. Danse Nito Temtik, I am welcoming you as distinguished folks who are joining me uh, here today uh, using uh, the Cree language. Uh, the Nihi language of the Nihiawak uh, people of the Four Directions, uh, which is uh, one of my uh, ancestral uh, legacies. Wapisk gagageo nihiaw nitsigaso kiwetnak utsinia. My name is Lois Edge. I shared my spirit name with you, which is a White Raven. Um, 
uh, or the, the raven at dawn's light. I acknowledge the homeland of my ancestors, uh, the Dene Métis of Dene Da, where I, upon which territory I reside. Um, acknowledge uh, my French Cree Métis and Dene Soline Chipoyan ancestry, uh, paternally and uh, Scottish, uh, British and Gwich'in um, paternally, sorry. Uh, French Cree Métis, Dene Soline, Chipoyan, matern maternally, and uh, British, uh, Scots, British, and Gwich'in paternally. Acknowledge the earth uh, that gives us life uh, and all of the, our ancestors uh, who are here with us today. And I give thanks for the gift of this beautiful day. Um, as uh, Thamina has indicated, I'm an instructor at Yorkville University for the Indigenous Perspectives in Canadian Education course. And I also teach Indigenous Education and Indigenous Studies courses in Alberta and here in the Northwest Territories. Um, um, yes, a mother and a grandmother, um, a grandson and a granddaughter. Uh, and I am a member of the Métis Nation Northwest Territory uh, as, as this uh, geographical space was historically known. Um, so I was invited uh, to join you here today in acknowledgement of Indigenous History Month here in Canada. Uh, that history uh, remains with us still today and yet to come uh, in the future as evidenced in our individual feelings of anger, sorrow, grief and confusion and our collective response of horror in recent weeks upon discovery of the bodies of 215 children in a grave site at the Kamloops Residential School and a growing awareness that there are many, there may be many more unmarked grave sites, both known and unknown, um, as will continue to be discovered and identified in the coming weeks and months and years, even though the last residential school in Canada shut down within recent memory uh, in 1996. Uh, I'm going to just give you a brief synopsis of residential schools in Canada um, based upon the timeline provided in the, the legacy, um, legacy of Residential Schools uh, website, um, which I'll refer you to after I, I, um, a bit later. Um, and the reason I'm giving you a synopsis of residential schools is because um, many people are not familiar with that history. Um, so from the early 1800s up until the mid 1990s, for more than 150 years, about 150,000 First Nations, Métis and Inuit children attended close to 150 residential schools in, Ca uh, in Canada. Uh, four generations uh, in my family, um, on both sides of the family, attended residential schools in Fort Chipoyan, Fort Providence, uh, Fort Resolution, and Fort Smith. Um, when I was growing up, no one in our family, extended family, or the community um, where I live, uh, spoke about residential schools. Uh, they were, uh, you know, a norm in our in our in our everyday lives, but uh, they were not uh, acknowledged or recognized as being unique or distinct in in any way in terms of our lived experience or the lived experience of previous generations. Um, so today, um, I thought, you know, what might I what might I speak about, um, and. Um, and, and what can I say to you that might make a difference, uh, any difference uh, at all uh, to anyone? Uh, because there is no time to address uh, the, what we're now describing as the dark history of residential schools in Canada. There's no time to talk about the legislative framework uh, designed and engineered over centuries to eliminate inherent and sovereign rights roles, responsibilities, and accountabilities uh, in first, to First Nations, Métis, and Inuit in Canada. 
to name uh, to name a select few, that legislative framework um, includes uh, the Royal Proclamation of 1763, Gradual Civilization Act of 1857, British North America Act of 1867, Dominion Lands Act of 1872, the Act of Gradual Civilization of 1869, the Indian Act of 1876 and subsequent amendments, uh, 1879 Davin Report, uh, numbered treaties, including Treaty 8 and Treaty 11 uh, here in the Northwest Territories, um, 1982 Constitution Act, uh, and of course, more recently, um, we're looking to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People or UNDRIP. Um, I did not learn any of this history in school, in K-12 to uh, or at university. Um, uh, I was in the Faculty of Arts uh, studying the social sciences for both my bachelor and uh, master's levels uh, degrees and moved into uh, Indigenous people's education at the doctoral level. Um, it, it, so uh, I did not learn any of these history, uh, any of this history um, in, in university classrooms uh, either until I enrolled in, a, in an Indigenous education course uh, taught by an Indigenous uh, instructor. And Indigenous history is, is not commonly taught at schools, colleges or universities still today, even though in, in um, in very recent years, since the release of the calls to action by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, um, we're, we're, we're seeing uh, you know, responses from high, in higher education in terms of uh, uh, bringing Indigenous content uh, into classrooms, uh, into course, uh, classrooms, courses and uh, programs of study. Uh, but there's really no time to talk, and there is no, really no time uh, to talk about the legis about legislation uh, that outlawed Indigenous people from participating in traditional ceremonies uh, or gathering in groups. Uh, it would have been against the law to gather together uh, in a public space, uh, perhaps reminiscent of current re recent current uh, months. Uh, it would have been against the law to hold a ceremony um, to wear traditional dress. Uh, it would have been illegal, uh, for example, here in the north to hold a feeding the fire ceremony, which is um, uh, has become more common today uh, uh, here in the north. Uh, it would have been illegal um, uh, to drum, to sing and, and drum, uh, to wear a Métis sash or, or a ribbon skirt uh, in public spaces. It's hard for us to imagine such uh, today. Um, and as early as 1900, there were stories of physical and sexual abuse and neglect at residential schools. In 1907, Dr. Peter Bryce conducted an investigation of residential schools on behalf of Indian Affairs. The schools were underfunded, poorly ventilated and overcrowded. The children were malnourished and in poor health. Tuberculosis was epidemic. Mortality rates were estimated between 35 and 60%. Translated as one in three or two in three children dying from TB. Dr. Bryce's report determined residential schools to be dangerous to the health of children and a national crime. During those same years, Duncan, Camp Duncan Campbell Scott, former superintendent and employee of Indian Affairs over several decades came up with a, quote, final solution to the Indian problem, unquote, to, quote, forcibly civilize and Christianize Indian children, end of quote. The federal government entered into joint agreements with the Roman Catholic, Anglican, and other churches to run the schools. Impossible working conditions, long hours, low salaries, unsanitary and overcrowded conditions attracted teachers and administrators who could not access employment elsewhere and who often took their frustrations out on the children. These workplaces attracted sexual predators. By 1920, attendance at residential school was compulsory for all Indian children ages seven to 15 years. The education of native people was downgraded 
uh, so that Aboriginal children receive training only to become farmhands, laborers, and domestic workers. This was so Aboriginal people could not compete for employment opportunities with settler Canadians. Children who attended the schools experienced vulnerability, spiritual emptiness, feelings of abandonment, and unsafe living environments. There was gender separation of siblings, boys and girls, forbidden to speak their ancestral language and forced to learn English. Many died from serious beatings, took their own lives, or lost their lives while running away, trying to return home over great distances. Some of you are familiar with the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. The TRC listened to the testimony of 7,000 uh, survivors across the country. Uh, in particular, uh, the TRC report says Métis students were treated as second-class citizens at residential schools, experiencing racism from both sides, from fellow students and from teachers and administrators. Métis students were not wanted in white schools and were not recognized as Aboriginal by Indian Affairs. Métis parents had to pay for their children to attend the schools and Métis students were required to earn their education, uh, which is the case still today uh, amongst Métis uh, attending higher education institutions in, in Southern Canada. For those who are First Nations, uh, Métis and Inuit, uh, children, youth, adults, elders and little ones, uh, each of us remains impacted by the lived experience of our relatives, community members and ancestors who attended uh, residential schools. Um, I wanted to speak uh, today in, um, in, in reference to the intergenerational impact and legacy of residential schools in, in, um, to, in response to and, and to address um, uh, normative uh, comments that have become normative, such as, um, why don't you just get over it <laughs> and, and let's move on. Um, it, the past is the past. Um, but in reality, in, in reality, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people are impacted by the intergenerational legacy of residential school schools. It's not something that we commonly, uh, that we are necessarily aware of or recognized, but each of us is impacted uh, to varying, uh, varying degrees. Uh, we each inherit a legacy from our ancestors as lived experience, uh, passed from generation to generation. Much in the same way Indigenous people inherit the inherent right to self-determination and self-government as the descendants of the First Peoples of the continent of North America. Aboriginal people know about the intergenerational impact of residential school. We know about it in our own lives and households, in our in our <laughs> living rooms, in our own living rooms, uh, through the lives of our brothers and sisters, uh, our children and grandchildren, uh, our parents, aunts, aunts and uncles, grandparents and great grandparents. We recognize how residential schools continue to impact our day-to-day -day lives, our health and wellness today. The TRC states that intergenerational survivors um, remain impacted by the experiences of previous generations who lived in the dysfunctional environment of residential schools, the roots of which, as mentioned, are traced to federal government legislative framework and uh, policy of assimilation intended to fracture and destroy the Aboriginal family in an attempt to eradicate Indigenous language, culture, traditions, and practices. The TRC describes this as cultural genocide. So what, what to do? What can we do? Uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commi Commission remen recommends uh, truth and healing as starting points uh, before reconciliation. If you read the first chapter of the final report, um, they speak to truth, healing, and reconciliation. 
Um, so some are saying the finding of the remains of the 215 children will ignite change uh, towards reconciliation. Um, I don't know what the answers, the answers are, uh, certainly a, a contested uh, topic, uh, but I do know that healing uh, is a good beginning. This means that each of us has to acknowledge our lived reality, to take individual responsibility and be accountable for our day-to-day -day actions at home, in the workplace, and in our community. Uh, I've been reading and listening to the words of Indigenous women talk about the discovery of the remains of the 215 children in Kamloops. The women speak uh, uh, to hearing the children's voices in the wind and ask that we listen to their bones speak. They say the children are saying, quote, they found us, end of quote. Imagine the power of light and love of the spirits of those little ones, those 215 blessed beings waiting and coming back to force us to revisit and acknowledge our shared history, the lived experience of our families, relatives, and ancestors, reminding us to listen to the voices of survivors and intergenerational survivors, uh, to listen to our voices in support of each of our own individual and collective healing and wellness here today. Mekse, Masi Cho. Thanks for listening. Hi, hi. Thank you so much, Dr. Edge. Um, I don't know if there was further slides or if we were going to those or if this was the, the main slide. Uh, just a moment. Yeah, um, I have the source document and refer individuals to the this particular uh, website. Um, it has an excellent uh, uh, informative uh, timeline. Um, there's an exhibit, uh, and there are also you can also listen to the stories of survivors. Um, and there's a, a, um, a, a brief uh, half-hour uh, video specific to uh, residential schools under uh, can be found under resources. It's an uh, an excellent uh, resource. Great, thank you so much for, for sharing those. I know that we'll definitely um, be taking any questions that people might have, but thank you for really um, summarizing that that for us in terms of residential schools and the history. Um, and a lot of the focus, as you mentioned, of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission on healing and, and that being the first step. Um, I mean, we'll certainly be taking questions, but I know something that I felt was very moving uh, this particular week was in the House of Commons, we did have um, an MP, uh, Mumilak Kakak from, uh, from Nunavut, who mentioned, um, she was actually, she's an outgoing MP and she won't be seeking re-election. And she gave a quite moving and scathing, um, rightfully so scathing speech about not feeling safe in the House of Commons um, and having to give herself pep talks in the washroom before she even would go in there. And I think she mentioned a lot of the um, sort of uh, surveillance that she felt as well as an, as an Indigenous woman and an Inuit woman. Um, and something that she said really struck me in terms of us as non-Indigenous peoples understanding what we can do to create safer spaces. Um, she mentioned that it's not enough for those of us that are non-Indigenous to say we understand what, uh, what is going on, especially when it comes to some of the issues she was raising, whether that's um, the prevalence of missing and murdered Indigenous women or the epidemic of um, the suicide rate in, in Nunavut. And what she really mentioned was that um, if there's no backing, if there's no financial backing or no room in our budgets for addressing these types of issues, um, that type of quote unquote understanding is actually really painful uh, for her, she mentioned as an Indigenous woman. So um, it was it was a sobering moment because she was mentioning that a lot of these 
you know, pretty words, uh, whether it's reconciliation or diversity and inclusion, um, or her being called courageous or brave, um, was not really something that she saw as being a tangible uh, action or being transformed into tangible action. So I think um, that's kind of the, the main questions that, uh, I think arising from this is that what can we as non-Indigenous people do in terms of cultivating that sense of cultural safety for people that are Indigenous um, in our spaces, especially at, in the university sphere as well? Um, <laughs> so many, um, there's so many, so many, um, uh, thoughts I have that I can speak to and, or, uh, I, I'll just say, um, uh, as a, as an educator, uh, one of, one of, one of the privileges of being an educator is that we, uh, as educators can listen to the voices of youth. Uh, which are, uh, I describe as, um, uh, they often uh, uh, share, articulate uh, clarity of vision uh, to see things clearly in a manner that um, as, as we age, um, uh, that the ability to see, th to see things clearly uh, diminishes or blurs or fades as we become set in our way, in our ways. And so the voice of youth, I think, um, uh, oftentimes, um, you know, gives us insight into, uh, I guess, lived reality. Um, certainly, as a, as indigenous, uh, as an indigenous woman, um, <laughs> working in um, higher education, um, the uh, the the works the workplace environment. Um, I would certainly hesitate to describe as as one uh, where uh, one where one might feel safe. Um, uh, and so, you know, talking about the intergenerational legacy of residential schools, uh, you know, the uh, you know the missing and murdered Indigenous women uh, across Canada's, you know, um, an ev evidence is that 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 shared legacy uh, that we that we inherit. Um, you mentioned cultural safety, um, I think, which, you know, sort of emerged from within uh, the health profession and which is um, evolving um, more so uh, into the idea of cultural competency. Um, you know, for us, for, for individuals to be um, informed in terms of uh, strengthening our foundational knowledge about uh, Indigenous peoples, historically, uh, traditionally and contemporarily. Um, uh, yes, um, yeah, you, you've touched on a lot of things. I, in terms of allyship, um, I think um, what I would say about allyship is, um, you know, in, in the interest of, of good relationships, um, in the absence of trust, um, it takes uh, time to build trust. Uh, so the investment of time uh, patience, uh, energy, uh, listening, uh, fostering and practicing uh, mutual uh, respect, and really resisting uh, norms in terms of social inter uh, social interaction. Um, it's it's very 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 challenging uh, for many individuals. Uh, ultimately, uh, for me personally, it's about practicing uh, living and practicing uh, empathy. Uh, love, empathy, and compassion um, to, uh, you know, to be, uh, to, to be curious um, and to, uh, uh, I guess, wholeheartedly uh, on an ongoing basis, seek uh, personal growth, uh, transformative uh, learning experiences. Um, yeah, as an, as an individual. Um, yeah, my heart goes went out to that to that young woman, um, and, and I, I think I can safely say, uh, as an Indigenous woman, woman, um, the, uh, I hesitate to speak on behalf of anyone else, but I would suggest that we've all experienced and felt exactly what she has articulated. Um, yes, call uh, you know calling people um, in a manner that perhaps only. Uh, uh, someone who's young can. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Edge. I'm just looking at one of the comments or questions in our chat um, from Dominique Fournier. She, um, Dominique is saying, thank you so much for your summary and story. Um, how do you envision healing and accountability looking? How would you suggest that we work toward reconciliation when it requires a desire to be forgiven um, by the actual perpetrator? And, and Dominic is mentioning forgiveness does not require reconciliation, but profound healing um, needed for reconciliation, which must have an acknowledgement of wrongdoing and a willingness to reconnect where reconnection seems so out of reach. Um, so I think there's a focus here on, on the, the perpetrator and sort of the working together with them, even though there is this focus on, on forgiveness. I don't know if um, you had any thoughts on that. Forgiveness, what is forgiveness? Um, I think um, you know, just maybe, <laughs> I'm trying to stay away from the personal, <laughs> but it always ends up in the, per, you know, right. as personal. Um, exactly. and, but, you know, in terms of forgiveness and the idea of um, uh, forgiveness, uh, what is forgiveness? Um, I think maybe it's more about acceptance, um, awareness, acknowledgement, recognition, and acceptance. Um, and, you know, there's, there, there's two sides of a coin or, you know, the pendulum swings, um, the pendulum swings. And at this, you know, at this point in time, this point in history, the, 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 uh, the, the uh, conversations, the discussions, the dialogue um, is, um, is, is, it's, <laughs> it's very uh, dense, uh, rich and complex. And it's uh, forced, uh, forced each of us to enter into this dynamic, uh, whether we want to engage or not. And so um, I, um, I've been uh, engaged in, uh, in another context, uh, in a, a learning environment with Indigenous educators, elders, and, and peers um, in, in, uh, over several months. And one of the things that... Um, one of the areas that, that is, is really core and central is the, the idea of relational accountability and who are we accountable to in terms of our relations and relationships. And ultimately, um, uh, it's about our relationship with self. Uh, what is our relationship to ourself? Um, you know, uh, oftentimes, uh, learners that come into an Indigenous education con context um, will resort to, um, uh, I guess, learned, uh, learned uh, ways of thinking, uh, you know, and that is to, uh, number one is uh, denial, um, resistance. Um, and so I, I encourage individuals, so, you know, um, if I'm hearing something, if I'm listening to something and I'm resisting it and I'm rejecting it and uh, uh, pushing it away, um, I try to be sensitive to when I, I experience that resistance and, and take a step back and ask myself, why am I resisting, you know, this new knowledge, right? Um, and trying to be more open um, uh, to that knowledge. Um, yeah, I know that, uh, I, I guess, I, I, you know, I, 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 I first walked into a university classroom 34 years ago. And for a minute, for a long, long time, and I came in there not knowing really very much about uh, who I was or where I came from. And I experienced tremendous uh, anger. Uh, I had a lot of anger uh, and, 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 and was enraged. And I had to enter into my own, my own individual healing process. Um, because if I didn't, I would not have survived. Um, and so, uh, and, and engagement in that healing process has, for me, um, you know, taken place over, over decades. And so my thinking is not about, per, you know, the perpetrator or wrongdoing, even mm -hmm. though that's very, very real, um, you know, in, the, in, the, in a socio-political legal uh, context. 
but I can't live in that space. Um, I have to think about, you know, mind, body, spirit, mental, physical, um, emotional, and spiritual uh, dimensions of my of my health and my and my well being. So, um, relational accountability for me is about a relationship with self and and acceptance, um, and in that acceptance, um, engaging with others. Um, in a manner that is uh, where there's a, a reciprocity that occurs, there's an exchange of um, uh, energy, um, I guess you could say. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot in that in that question. Um, but yeah, uh, so envisioning uh, healing, I think, is um, you know at the level of the individual, and looking at our mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional. Uh, health and wellness and what each of us can do um, on a day-to-day -day basis with inside our own heads <laughs> in right. our in our thinking and our actions and in our engagement within family extended family community in the classroom and broader contexts such as this absolutely no i think that's an excellent point uh, bringing that back to the individual and and what's going on inside of us because that has an impact on what's reflected outward and and what kind of relationships we have so thank you um so so very much dr edge i know we're getting uh, we're wrapping up, we're getting close to the end of the um, presentation and we do really appreciate some of the other questions that have been coming in. Um, one of the things that we, that uh, Deirdre and I and Dr. Edge were talking about before was some self-directed learning. Um, so there is a link that I will put out to a free University of Alberta course called um, Indigenous Canada. And um, it's an excellent resource. I just started using it myself yesterday. And, um, you know, I think it's a, a wonderful experience for us to avail ourselves of something that, um, that is free. And, and, and someone's saying in the panel here, uh, Nicole Rampersad is saying it's an excellent course. So I'd highly uh, recommend all of us, um, especially those of us that are non-Indigenous to please take advantage of this course. Um, thank you so much once again, Dr. Edge. We really appreciate your time and, and for sharing your knowledge with us um, and I will hand it over to Deirdre to wrap up. Could I make a closing? Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so in the context of uh, historical, uh, intergenerational, uh, epistemic uh, and uh, personal uh, violence um, in, within the context of uh, colonization, um, the uh, from, from where I come from, um, it's about uh, uh, learning uh, from uh, Indigenous uh, people, uh, about Indigenous philosophy, our principles, uh, values, uh, and beliefs, traditions, and practices, um, and uh, I guess uh, celebrating indigen indigen Indigeneity. Um, yeah, I just wanted to conclude with that remark. Excellent, thank you so much. Thank you for well, your opportunity. Dr. Edge, thank you so much. I, I almost have no words, which for those of you that know me tends to be a bit rare. <laughs> um, I have had the immense privilege of working with um, many Indigenous peoples in, in during training and have actually had um, the opportunity to work at uh, Blue Quills First Nations College, um, just outside of St. Paul, Alberta. And it was a, a very humbling experience to be there. It's, it's emotional. <laughs> and see um, the members of this community take over, if I can use that word, um, what had been a residential school. It, um, you could walk through the halls and, and feel the ghosts. And I, I had such admiration. I found it difficult, as you can probably tell, to, to be in that building. And I, I just could not imagine the bravery um, in, in retaking and, and now claiming this space. So these are incredibly important conversations that we need to have. And I am so grateful, Dr. Edge, that you gave us this gift this morning. And I really encourage everybody to um, take time to really explore this critically important issue. We can heal, but everybody has to do their part. So with that, 
Oh my goodness. Um, there was no better topic to end this iteration of our Ask an Expert series. So yes, those of you that are, are my regular Ask an Expert attendees, we are done. Um, we have been so blessed to have had some incredible speakers over the past 14 months or so uh, since we launched upon COVID lockdown. And I am incredibly grateful for how they have shared their wisdom, their stories and their knowledge with our communities. So this end is a bit bittersweet for me. Um, but with summer approaching and what looks like a return to campus for fall, Ask an Expert is going to be reimagined. So we're not going away forever, um, just what it looks like now. We're now going to do a special one hour uh, long event just once a month um, at a specific day and time. So we'll ask everybody to watch their emails, uh, follow us on social media, check out the Student Success Center events page so that you know that Ask an Expert is coming September 10th is World Suicide Prevention Day. And so we will be rejoined by Dr. Erga, who did an incredible talk last year on this critically important topic. We don't have a day yet, but just mark it in the back of your brains that we are coming back in September. And uh, in the meantime, please be well, be kind to each other, have a fantastic summer, and thank you so much for joining us today. I Dr. Edge, Dr. Edge, thank you so much. Yeah. I think Dr. Edge had one more point. Mm. Oh, uh, I just wanna say, uh, uh, Dr. Pickerel, that um, your response um, is evidence of the healing that occurs um, when we listen. Uh, so, uh, Masi Cho, for, for your heart, heartfelt engagement. Thank you, Dr. Edge. Thank you so Be much. well, everybody. Enjoy your weekend. Take care.